Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my Zone 5B Vegetable Garden. I know it doesn't look very different from the last time you saw it, and that's because we are having the coldest spring. It has been awful. We've had snow, rain, high winds, very cool temperatures. We've got snow again in the next few days, and you know, we're going into the middle of May. Enough is enough. But I do have things I wanted to show you today as an update on how what has been planted is doing and give you a few tips along the way. You'll recall that I'm growing my potato crop in grow bags this year. And you can see that the little sprouts are coming up. So that is really exciting. I'm going to let them grow a few inches and then I'm gonna add more soil and compost around them, let them grow some more, add in more soil, compost, some mulch, etc., until they fill up the bag. If you look closely, you can see tiny little onion plants, and those are ones that Bill started from seed. He transplanted them out into the garden a couple of weeks back, and something has been munching on a few of them, so we're keeping an eye out. It seems like it might be mice, but we don't know if it's birds as well. So we're keeping an eye on it, and if we need to put some netting around them to keep the birds away, we'll do that. And then I also wanted to show you who's keeping an eye over the onion bed. So that is Wiley the coyote. Some of you have commented on seeing him in the background, you know, what kind of dog is that and so on. It's actually a coyote decoy that we bought a few years ago for the express purpose of keeping quail away from young seedlings. Well, that worked for about two weeks and then they got used to him. So that was that. But in the meantime, Wiley has become not only our garden mascot, but our neighborhood's mascot because everybody checks on him when they go by the garden since we move him around. So that's kind of funny. But I did want to explain what he was all about. This is our carrot bed. You'll notice that it has bird netting over it for the obvious reason of keeping birds away. I did keep the boards on for 10 days and then remove them and the carrots are still not up yet. And even though they're a cool season crop, maybe they're not liking this weather that we've been having as well. You also notice that Bill has snuck some more onion seedlings down the middle of the bed, and that's okay. We love onions and we have a lot to plant. If you're not familiar with the board method for planting carrots, in theory, it is to prevent the soil from forming a crust on the surface, and it also helps the plants germinate more easily. I hope to see them any day now. And I do have a video on the process. There's a recent one that is on planting both broccoli and carrots, so you can find it there. Well, I stand corrected. I was just looking at the bed again, and if you look really closely, you can see some tiny carrot seedlings coming up. Hooray! So hopefully the rest of them will get on the ball and we'll see them too. Now you're looking through some insect netting that is over the broccoli bed. I wanted to show you how well the plants are doing. They have really perked up, finally. The netting is an agricultural insect netting that we got from agfabric.com. This is our first year of using it, so I can't tell you how well it works, but I'm hoping it will keep both the aphids and the cabbage worms away from the broccoli plants. Also on the left, you can probably see some tiny seedlings on the left side of that last drip tape run, and those are pak choy plants that Bill put in there. He figured they have the same pests, so why not? <laughs> One other thing that you'll notice is that there's some rings around the base of the broccoli plants. And I wanted to tell you what that's all about because I completely forgot to cover that in my broccoli video. Sorry about that, guys. This is what's at the base of each of the broccoli plants. These are plastic drain pipe rings that have copper tape applied to the outer perimeter. This is what it looks like when it's brand new. And even though this is darker now, it is still effective. So the thing about slugs is that their skin and antennas react electrically with copper. They want nothing to do with it. They don't want to come in contact with it. So what I do is normally at planting time, I just happened to forget it this year, when the plants are still small, I slip this down over the top very carefully, and then I snug it into the soil. 
so that it makes good contact all the way around. You don't want any little openings that the slugs could go underneath. And this works great. I've done this for years and it is such a simple way to keep slugs from eating the plants because they really love cabbage family crops. Now this is one of the do-it-yourself projects that's in my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. And what we did is Bill had some leftover three inch diameter plastic drain pipe. He cut a bunch of rings that are an inch and a half tall and then we peeled off the paper on the back side of this tape and put the tape around them. Very simple project. Now this tape is very easy to find in garden centers and online. The most common brand that I've ever seen is Cory's. And I believe the product is called Cory's Slug and Snail Copper Tape Barrier. But this works great. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that these rings work best on plants that have a single main stem that comes up. So things like broccoli, kale, cabbage, and so on. You can see that our greenhouse is getting pretty full. Of course, it's not a very big greenhouse. It's six feet by eight feet. But all of these plants in here are biding their time until the weather gets better. <laughs> so I have some perennials and some berry plants that are down on the floor. And then up on the benches, I've got tomatoes, peppers, some onion plants that just haven't been planted yet, a few annuals that are going in some baskets, the celery, the artichokes, the geraniums that I overwintered, and so on. So it is a lot of stuff. Now one thing you might have noticed in the background in the greenhouse is some of my winter sown containers. And this is an example of one of them. This is Dacus carota dara. It is in the carrot family, as you might guess. And it is a gorgeous flower that I have been seeing a lot on British gardening shows. And I thought, I have to grow that. It is ready to go out. I'm hoping they transplant okay because I didn't stop to think about how they are members of the carrot family and might have more of a tap root that doesn't transplant well. So I'm crossing my fingers on this because I really am excited to grow it. But the other things that I grew in the winter sown containers did really well except the straw flowers did not germinate at all. But otherwise I've got plants in there that are waiting to be put into the garden. Now one other thing I'm doing while I'm waiting for the weather to improve is I'm putting the plants through the hardening off process. And I have a recent video that explains it. But basically what it's doing is it's acclimating the plants to the intensity of the sunlight and the outdoor temperatures. And so the first day I put them out for an hour, put them back away. The next day two hours, put them back away. Three hours the next day and so on. This goes over the course of a week to 10 days and it is so important. If you have ever planted a tomato plant, let's say, where you started it indoors under lights and then you planted them out in the garden without doing the hardening off process, you've probably seen white patches and wilting plants. And that means that they got sunburned from the intensity of our sunlight. Grow lights, even though they're fantastic for starting plants from seed, are nowhere near the intensity of the sun. So I just wanted to remind you that you want to do this. The other thing that I want to remind you is to be patient. And Bill would laugh at me for saying that because patience is not my middle name. But try not to plant your seedlings too early outdoors if they're warm season crops. Here in Spokane, Washington, which is mostly hardiness zone 6, although we're in zone 5B because we're in a microclimate, usually the last frost is around the middle of May. Well, this year I have vowed to be patient and to wait until about the end of the month before I put things like tomatoes and peppers outside in the garden. So I just want to remind you, I know we're all excited and anxious for the season to get going. 
and if you live in a warmer climate you're probably wondering why I'm mentioning this but it is so important to wait until the temperatures both in the soil and the air are warm enough for these lovely warm season crops. Okay let's get back to the update on how everything is doing so far. This is the bed that we made a cover for and put agricultural insect netting over it and that's because this bed is planted with beets and Swiss chard. They are very susceptible to leaf miner damage. So that's why there's a cover on the bed. The seeds have germinated really well. Let me show you a close up of those. Here are some of the beet seedlings. I've got two rows of beets and one row of Swiss chard. You can see they're close together, but you can rest assured that once the plants are about three inches tall, I'm going to thin them within each row so that they are spaced three inches apart. And I'm going to eat the cold greens because they are so delicious. You might be wondering how my gutter peas are doing and you'll notice I still have the bed surrounded by floating row cover to keep the quail away. However, I have to be completely honest with you, they are really struggling. I think they're starting to hit their stride now, but the weather has been so cold I had to plant them about a week early because we were going out of town at Easter. and. It snowed while we were gone, not once, but twice. And so they really were hit with a setback. But they are starting to look better. And you know, one thing that I wanted to point out is that when something is planted in cool soil, oftentimes what happens is the microorganisms that make nitrogen available to the plants are not active yet. And so if you plant something uh, I've had this happen with corn, which is really noticeable. If the plants look kind of yellow, that's what's going on. They're not sick, but they sure want some nitrogen. So what I ended up doing when we got back in town is I gave them some liquid fish fertilizer, and I think that has perked them up a little bit. But they really were hit hard with the cold. Even though they're a cool season crop, there's only so much a plant can take. This next bed has been planted with fava beans and I noticed that the seeds have just started germinating so that's really cool. I'll give you a close up of that in a moment. You'll notice the bed is covered with netting and again that's to keep the coil away until the plants are a few inches tall. And there's some little fava bean sprouts. You can see this next bed has been covered with floating row cover which I've lifted off so you can see the seedlings inside. These are turnips, radishes, and beets. And yes, they're all cool season crops, but it has been so darn cold I've been trying to give some protection to them. <laughs> you just can't win some years. And here's another onion bed. <laughs> Bill and I love onions and we had so much fun making pickled onions and other things last year. So we've got quite a lot of onions that he started from seed and we're growing them in a few different beds. Now we're in the lettuce bed and you'll notice that there are some pack choy seedlings growing on the end here. Those are ones that Bill has been successively planting and we're really looking forward to having them in stir fries. Just to the left of them from front to back I have some arugula seeds that are now germinating and then I want to show you the lettuce. If you've seen some of my previous videos, you know that I started the lettuce seedlings early indoors and then have had them under these plastic cloches because I was trying to get a lettuce crop as early as possible. Well, it has worked well because it's been cold so much, I keep having to recover them. But I did want you to see how they're doing. A little rainwater on here. I just harvested lettuce from part of this front bed here so the plants are smaller. But let me show you them up close. They really are doing nicely. Okay, don't these look great? So I just harvested lettuce from here last night so these plants look a little smaller. But you can see the back double row here is doing great. I've got some Red sales lettuce, that's what these are. I've got butter crunch. The speckly ones are speckled trout. 
and I also have Lola Rosa, that's this reddish one here. So they're doing really great. And something I wanted to point out is when you're growing lettuce, it's important to use the cut and come again method of harvesting the leaves rather than the whole heads so that they will continue to produce for quite a while. And so what I do, let's say this is one that I wanted to cut from, I'll cut the outer leaves off and leave the center part because this is really the growing point of the plant. Same thing with these. I would cut these lower leaves and leave the main part of the plant. These are all a type of leaf lettuce and that's what it works best on. Not so great for something like iceberg lettuce, but this is a great way to get your lettuce, enjoy it, and have the plants produce more leaves so you can continually harvest them. Of course, with lettuce, once the temperatures really heat up this summer, they are going to stop growing. But that's just how it is, and we love to enjoy the lettuce for now, and then we'll plant it again later in the summer when temperatures start to cool down a little bit so that we can have more lettuce during later months of the season. Now, as I've mentioned in past videos, the main reason this cover is over the bed is because different types of birds such as the quail and finches think lettuce is delicious. And so we're trying to protect the plants from getting pecked to death, basically. However, we do have that pak choy in there and arugula. So both of those can be susceptible to certain types of damaging insects. So the cover is doing double duty. You might be wondering how the leeks are doing, so I thought I'd give you an update. You'll recall I did a video a few weeks ago about planting them, and I am so tickled to tell you that they're doing great. The soil within the holes has been slowly filling in around the leek plants, and they're growing great. The other end of the bed has more onions in it. Big surprise there. <laughs> And I thought I'd finish up with an update on the garlic and shallot bed. You can see the garlic plants are doing awesome. Shallots are down on this end. We didn't get 100% sprouting, but it's most of them, so that's good. I've got the rain gauge in here, and you can see we've been getting a bit of rain lately. Time to empty it out. All right, thanks so much for watching today, everybody. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.